Thank you very much, Hans, uh, for the very nice introduction. Um, yes, indeed. So this talk is going to be about um, how to extract knowledge from high throughput experimentation using hopefully only um, a cheap and automated experimentation, or mostly, let's say. So um, the topics of this talk are going to be First, I would like to introduce how we do um, at, at the High Earn Institute here, a combined data-driven and knowledge-driven experimentation in high-throughput workflows. And then I show um, three examples. So I will also um, say I'm back on air again. I apologize for this um, short introduction uh, interruption. Um, I was saying that um, I would like to show after the introduction um, three examples how we use um, high throughput workflows to obtain high fidelity data. So we are looking at improving the order in bilayer organic photovoltaic devices, which have certain advantages over um, the typical bulk heterojunction devices. So here using a robotic setup <clears throat> makes sure that really only one processing condition is right. And then we can train a fast optical proxy on an expensive experiment. So to have a faster experimentation from then on. Then I would like to show how we understand and how we control the electrical performance and the morpho morphological degradation um, in um, organic photovoltaic devices, how we can control that by the choice of the process conditions. Here we have the advantage, we use only one donor acceptor combination, we use the same batch, same solution preparation, and we vary the process conditions. Then last example is we would like to understand the connection between the air, between the resilience of donor acceptor blends against, let's say, ambient air and light, and its molecular structure. So here we do the opposite way. We um, keep the process conditions exactly the same, and we vary the, um, the donor and the acceptor material. So <clears throat> now, um, yeah, it works. Um, next slide is showing how we are doing um, high throughput device fabrication and characterization. I think Jens is going to talk a whole lot more about it in detail, just a short outline. This is an automatic um, um, <clears throat> line where we can do autonomous preparation and characterization of organic photovoltaic devices right from the preparation of the, <clears throat> um, of the single layers, their past deposition of the electrodes up to the characterization and the degradation. <clears throat> it's all uh, programmed and automatic. And in the meantime, it can even be run autonomously. It can do hundreds of layer variations per day, and it can optimize a composition and the device architecture. So with a run with a typical Bayesian optimization, um, it is, um, let's say, originally kind of black box. So you have a, a certain set of process parameters, like the thickness, the annealing, um, uh, the uh, controlled by spin speed, the annealing, your choice of additives, and so on. And you have a functionality that you're interested in, like the, um, the degradation perform and the performance. And Bayesian optimization helps you to find the best process parameters in, in this uh, chosen space to go to the optimization. Now, of course, um, we would like to understand, because we have heard during this afternoon, that um, the human in the loop can be helpful. So we want to understand why and that is why we added, um, let's say, the knowledge-based approach, and we try to combine them and bring them ever closer together. So what we do is we um, use on this line, on this Amanda line, um, and also offline, we use um, optical spectroscopy mainly, but also other techniques. And we have <clears throat> some, we use our photophysical understanding to do some dimensionality reduction from the spectra which give us optical features, which we know are related to morphology. And now, since we have the connection between morphology and functionality, this brings us into the, posi in the uh, position to actually compare this with models. 
So this is the final goal that we want to uh, uh, bring the knowledge driven and the data driven approach together by <clears throat> understanding um, the underlying uh, physical principles. Okay, the problem statements, what we are studying here, basically most of what we do is towards maximizing the performance and the stability of organic solar cells. We have heard in the first talk <clears throat> um, by Aram that um, the stability is one uh, um, main problem of organic solar cells. So we're looking into this. Um, organic solar cells have performance-wise strongly increased since the introduction of so-called non-fullerene acceptors. The change they introduced was they switched from a high driving force system to a low driving force system. So um, uh, classically, historically, we used the uh, fullerene acceptors like PCBM, which had a, a strong driving force for the separation, for the transfer of the exciton, the splitting of the exciton to form a charge transfer state. But this charge transfer state had already much lower energy, which led to VOC, which led to losses in the open circuit voltage and therefore also in the final um, performance. Now, this is much better when you have when you use non-fullerene acceptors where you can tune the energy level so that whole transfer is nearly isoenergetic. So you can use the, the absorption from the from the non-fullerene acceptor and transfer the whole to the donor. Um, but this has now possible consequences on the um, on the lifetime because if the uh, energies are so close, then there can be um, a Boltzmann equilibrium. So you have long excited state lifetimes, and that entails possible degradation mechanisms, which start from, for example, the triplet state. So you can have um, triplet induced interaction with singlet oxygen. You can have interaction with ozone. Um, and um, uh, you can have other uh, ways how um, uh, photo oxidation is, uh, proceeds because you have long um, or high density of still excited neutral states in the material. The second is morphological degradation. As you see on the right, that's a crystal structure of one of the famous molecules of uh, non fullerene acceptors, the so called Y6. They come. They um, organize in very specific um, arrangements, and they are very important to give them this um, high um, that, um, mobility um, for the for the high performance. But this um, um, is is very critical to maintain this conformation, so this uh, this alignment, and it is um, so it's easy to go into another phase where um, the stability. Um, where the performance suffers. So that's a possible reason for um, um, performance degradation by morphology. For example, you can have a demixing of donor and acceptor. You can have a reorientation from an advantages orientation to a less advantages one at the interface. Or you can have um, a demixing along the stacking gradient. So these are all things that can occur that also occurred partially in um, the, the historical um, the photovoltaic systems, but with uh, non fluorine acceptors, they are especially critical. So what can we do? How can we control them? One possibility is we lock the molecules. That's the so-called concept of single component solar cells. Um, the other way is we order the molecules. That means um, we increase the activation barrier for the movement. We have seen, so I've seen in the last slide that motion is um, a condition for the changes that, that uh, lower the uh, performance. Or we we, what we also do by ordering is we increase the headroom for electrical performance loss. How is this done? It, I will show two ways in which we try to do this. In one, <clears throat> on one hand, we try to control the process conditions in bulk heterojunction formulation, or we formulate bilayer devices. So um, now I would like to um, look into the um, study of morphology control. So we look at the performance and stability of organic photovoltaic devices by varying the morphology. Um, this is work done by Xiaoyan um, Du. Um, published in Zhu, and um, it was, as I said in the beginning, 
um, always the same material, always PM6 as the donor and Y6, the molecule that we have seen before as the acceptor. And now the, um, the device structure was also kept constant, but then there was a variation of the process parameters. And there we had the donor acceptor ratio, the spin speed, the annealing time and the temperature, the choice of additives to the solvent. So that's volatile additives that go away, but slow everything down. The electron um, transport layer um, and other parameters. So um, the idea is now to um, um, perform build the devices, look at their performance, look at their lifetime, look at the UV vis spectra, extract features and relate these morphology related features to the performance and stability to get a predictive model. And if we're lucky, we can justify the trends that we find. So um, that's um, how it looks like. That's the single um, uh, experiments that have been done um, on on the Amanda, so that's um, different runs where, where different parameters have been varied. You see the differences these process conditions impose on the JV, on the current voltage curves, and you see a clear uh, um, connection to the optical spectra. On the right, you see the acceptor. On the left, you see the donor. And it's very clear if you use a donor acceptor ratio, which is strongly on the donor side here, this gray curve, um, which is seen here by a strong, by a very weak um, 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 acceptor absorption. Then um, you see that um, the fill factor gets horrible. So there's a clear connection between the what you can see in the optical spectrum and what you can see in the device performance. Same is true for the spin speed. So if we have thick films as identified by a strong absorption, then we have a reduction of the fill factor. We have in the, in the, in the annealing temperature, there's very strong effects on, um, on the optical um, band gap of the acceptor. And that makes, of course, a difference in, in the VOC because that's the main um, optical band gap of the system. So, it is clear, well, um, I need to cite the last one here, the, um, um, the annealing of the ETL. You see a huge effect on the JV curves, but the effect on the optical spectra is very little. So this already points to a limitation. If it doesn't happen in the active layer, then it is um, uh, uh, probably um, not connecting to the electrical um, performance. Um, but generally, we see a strong um, connection between electrical and optical features. So now we use um, physical knowledge. So we know um, that um, spectra in organic molecules have this, um, this frank condom progression due to electron phonon coupling, and that the height of these bands is linked to order. So if this first, this zero, zero transition is very strong, then we have highly ordered um, chains. And typically um, we need, we cannot model such a spectrum by only assuming a single frank condom transition, but we need to assume a second one, which is the so-called amorphous phase underneath with, with strongly broadened and unstructured bands. And there are often also in these, it has been shown in these initial publications that you can also show by experimental conditions that this um, amorphous phase is actually there. So the nice thing here is, this is a model which is known, with, which uh, comes from known physics and which can be automated. So this um, fitting, this model um, has relatively few free parameters because these, uh, the relative height of the shoulder is linked by this so-called Wang Ries factors. Um, and so this can be automated so that um, fit, fitting can be done in a high throughput fashion without human intervention. And we have um, done this and um, here is written which morphology, morph morphological information is contained. So you, you can learn about the oscillator strength. You can learn about the effective conjugation length. Um, you can learn about the domain size and the dielectric environment. 
Um, <clears throat> and this is um, the pipeline in which we have applied this. So uh, um, using this technique to extract these optical features from the optical spectrum, running a Gaussian process regression on it, which gives us this surrogate objective function shown here as a, as a colored hypersurface and um, using um, this to predict um, the electrical features um, we are interested in. So this is, um, our, our idea is this is a statistical method. So it, it's purely statistic, um, but what it finds, the surrogate objective function is actually the underlying physics. It is a deterministic, nonlinear and multifunctional function which um, relates a target feature to a predictor. Yeah, so there, this is where the physics is in. So let's look what comes out. If we do this, um, we see that we are pretty good in predicting VOC. We are not so good predicting in the fill factor, but still the, the trends of the various uh, predictors that we have looked at make sense from a physics point of view. So if we look at PCE, the, so the, the overall power, the prediction is quite okay. And we have strong predictors here. And um, one is um, the amount of order in the donor phase. That's, uh, that's uh, strongly uh, correlated. And um, another um, prominent feature is the total absorption, which is the thickness. And we see, both of these, both these predictors occur also in the fill factor. And that makes sense. That would, that is where what every physics model would predict as well. So if we make the film thicker, then the fill factor goes down. And if we decrease, if we increase the order, then we decrease the extraction mobility, which should bring up, which should improve the fill factor. So these, um, uh, this, these um, the trends with respect to the features, they are related to the underlying physics. Um, now the same thing can be done with degradation. And here we also find a, a dependence of the fill factor loss with the film thickness and also with other uh, morphological features. So, <clears throat> um, okay, um, I must also mention that uh, some of these features are connected. So there's, there's not, there's not uh, a, 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 they're not independent, but it depends on the process conditions. Some of these features relate to each other, but this can be distinguished by uh, feature extraction methods I will discuss um, at the end of this presentation. So summarizing, um, um, I've shown you that the electric performance of the organic solar cells can be um, predicted just from the knowledge of the active layer optical properties. And we're now using this actually to speed up the autonomous um, optimization on our lines um, um, at the higher Institute. Because as I said, this um, the, the whole pipeline, the Gaussian process and the, um, the, the feature extraction by spectral fitting is automated. So it doesn't require human intervention. Um, the trends with structural features are related to the underlying physics, and this can be used to optimize both performance and stability at the same time. So the next point to um, work with microstructure is to go in bilayer devices. And there's a, there's a nice method uh, which, is, uh, which has been um, uh, developed, um, with, uh, which is called floating film transfer, by which um, we use um, the material we want to form a film with in a, in a solution which is going to spread on water. So that depends on the surface tension um, if it's in the right range, then it will spread and it will fill up the whole space, the whole Petri dish, which is um, uh, uh, which it has at its, its disposal. And then we can use a substrate and the substrate will grab this film by, um, by adhesion. And in this way, we can do bilayer or even multi-layer um, uh, structures. Um, because we do not need to provide just a substrate. We can also have already a substrate with something else um, deposited on top. And so we can make donor acceptor bilayer devices. And what you see here is um, a cross-sectional view um, of a device which has IT4F as an acceptor and PM6 as a donor. And you see this very sharp interface 
So that's that's really it gives it gives a very abrupt interface with a nice um, smoothness. So it's it's not corrugated, um, and that's of course nice because um, this is something we can also model easily. So um, that inserts well into our structure to to gain uh, knowledge. Um, so what wrong is this is um, um, a work by Rong Wang in, in our institute, and she has added to this solution an additive called DIO, diodo obtain, um, which is um, an additive which slows down the evaporation because it's a high, high boil, boiling point um, additive. And she's found out that adding this um, will order the PM6, the deposited PM, PM6 film. And she has looked at the GWAX profile, and it really shows that um, changing the um, additive um, uh, contribution uh, concentration, the in-plane um, um, signal gets stronger, from which we can conclude that we go from an amorphous phase where no additive is there, when only the chlorobenzene is there, to a phase-on-oriented, very ordered structure. And that gives a preferential in-plane orientation. Um, <clears throat> and this is very important because uh, one uh, a critical limitation of um, bilayer devices is the exciton diffusion length because um, the charge transfer happens only at the interface with the, between donor and acceptor. And if the layers are larger than the exciton diffusion length, then these excitons cannot be split at the interface. So it's very important to increase the order of these phases. And <clears throat> what we have done, we have applied our spectral um, uh, fitting um, uh, technique to this study. And we found that we have an, a predictor, which is the order, the, the, the ratio between order and amorphous phase. And com compare it with the crystal coherence length, which can be extracted from GWAX, which is a measure of the domain size. And we see, that's the green line down here, that it follows the same trend as the crystal coherence length from, from GWAX. So that means that we can use this as an approximate um, <clears throat> uh, proxy experiment, which is of course much, much faster and is inline and completely automatic compared to a GWAX experiment. So I'm not saying that we can replace GWAX experiments. However, once this is known and for similar materials, it will work the same way. So it will at least allow us to replace most of the GWAX experiments we would need otherwise. Um, finally, I comment on what it does to the electrical performance. So you see um, if going from this order to Phase on oriented brings high, strongly brings up the, the JSC, which we expected because of now better um, exciton um, diffusion to the interface. And we're getting not fully, but relatively close to the uh, uh, corresponding Balmetro junction. And you see also in the um, EQE spectra that the device with 2%, the, the light blue one, 2% of the additive has at least in the acceptor region <clears throat> um, a comparable um, EQE as the bulk heterojunction. Um, okay, the last point is of course the, st uh, the stability and also the stability which we hoped for would, um, uh, would um, strongly improve in, in the bilayer. And indeed the bilayer with the additive is uh, clearly much more stable than the corresponding bulk heterojunction. These are 300 hours <clears throat> in, in the dark, but also in, in one sunlight, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very stable. And it's, it um, suffers much less from fill factor degradation than the bulk heterojunction, comparably. So um, that means successfully achieved by the bilayer approach. There's no demixing and there are no unfavorable vertical gradients formed. And still the, um, the performance is nearly as high as in the bulk region. So if time permits, I would like to come to the last point 
of um, this presentation as to look into the air light resilience in um, donor acceptor blends for organic solar cells. The problem is um, if they want to have an industrial um, perspective, they should not be formulated under, um, uh, under a vacuum, but they should be possible to be formulated in ambient conditions. There will be some oxygen water uptake before electrode deposition and encapsulation. So we need to predict how resilient the, these um, um, materials will be um, under these conditions. So the best thing, the, the hope is that we can learn um, to predict air light resilience from molecular structure. And the way to go there is we use a library of donor accepted compounds. We measure the performance and stability, and we create predictive models using features from chemical structure. So <clears throat> that's the procedure. This is again a work of Xiaoyan, um, which we are currently submitting. So um, where films are deposited, everything is again um, automated. Then um, after the position of the active layer, we perform an aging step under room light, so it's not under one sun, it should mimic the process conditions. So we have ambient conditions, room temperature, and a typical room um, illumination. And then uh, we de uh, deposit the electrodes and uh, measure again, and we compare this with structures which have not undergone this aging. So we can compare the um, performance loss, which they have suffered as a function of the material that we have used. So these are the typical the, the, the set of materials that we have used. Um, we have used different donor materials and different acceptor materials. And this is the overview of what we have found. So some of these materials on the x-axis is the performance, PCE, and on the y-axis is um, the PCE reduction after 30 minutes, air and light aging. And you see there are some materials which perform pretty well under both aspects, but there are also some which have a high um, um, per performance, but low stability and, uh, and, and a high stability, but not so good performance. And there seems to be such kind of Pareto frontier. We heard this term in, from Leuk in the last presentation. So there's possibly we need to find out um, um, is this real and what is it due to? Can we maybe overcome this, um, this frontier? Um, so um, what we have done is we selected a series of um, predictors. These are handcrafted structural features and they are very simple. There's just numbers, yeah? Um, numbers of elements in the molecule and they're all known to have a certain structure property relationship. So here the confinement works on the, on the donor, uh, on, on the band gap, the perform on the heteroatoms, presence of heteroatoms changes the level, it's the homo and lumo levels. Then we have these aryl bridges, um, a B phenyl or a five ring, five ring bridges that change the torsional angle and thus the effective conjugation. And then we have, um, um, these spiral um, bridges and, and the availability, availability of spacers, which um, uh, interact with the, uh, with the solubility and the, the ability to form um, uh, 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 a solid state um, uh, with other compounds. So these are the structural features. We have also energetic features like the level position, the, the, the donor acceptor, um, the, this charge transfer energy. And we have, as I discussed before, the morphological features um, from um, the spectrum. And now, of course, these are a lot of features. And the problem is um, they all are interconnected, or many of them are interconnected. So this is the Pearson correlation matrix. And um, it is um, hopeless to, um, to do a regression model using them all. But it is nice to look at this before doing any regression to see um, what is the active physics. For example, here in this range, we have all these acceptor features and they all have positive intercorrelation. And this is what you expect if you have strong J aggregation. And a similar thing, albeit not that strongly, happens in the donor region where, they, where we have the donor morphology. Uh, yeah. Um, also here, red color means strong um, uh, positive cross-correlation. And this is what is 
expected when the Spano model of weak age aggregate um, is active. So actually that's satisfying that we find um, that our, our predictors um, behave the way we expect them. There are other things we need to look at. If it's near unity correlation, that sounds the alarm plot that could be artifacts. For example, here we have a correlation of minus one, a perfect correlation, but that makes sense because it's a correlation between the, um, the acceptor um, molar fraction and the donor molar fraction. Of course, that should be perfectly anti-correlated. However, here we have another anti-correlation and that might actually be an artifact. So a kind of correlation between the amorphous phase and the width of the donor. So this is something which, can, which we can see looking in this overview graph that we might need to change the model. So going on to um, the, the real regression, we need to do some dimensionality regression and uh, reduction. And we have done, we have been running a GPR, Gaussian process regression with an embedded um, MR, MR feature select, which means minimum redundancy, maximum relevance. And that just means we run the Gaussian process with single features one by one. And you see, they are all strongly correlated. And then we pick the strongest one. And now we run it a second time with two features. And now you see the additional explanation of variance that the second feature brings is actually very much down compared to the previous run. So that shows how intercorrelated they were, but it's not zero. So still um, the strongest of these ones should be included into the final feature list. But once we included this, this one, the third run with the green dots, is basically baseline for this. Now we have all the information that we can get from our features is in the list of features. And that's how we perform the study. And that's the result. So um, we, we were looking at the remaining, the percentage of remaining JSC, short circuit current, um, after 30 minutes of air light for these different donor acceptor combinations. And if we um, allow the, um, all features to contribute. So if we allow the MRMR um, um, algorithm to choose between all features, then it picks um, the charge transfer energy and the, um, the width of the acceptor exciton as the dominant features explaining 84% of the variance. So this fit looks actually quite good. Now, if we re restrict the MRMR, to only um, the structural features, these simple handcrafted features, we also find a relatively good um, um, prediction. And it, and it chose, and it picked uh, features which relate to, um, to the HOMO level or the, uh, to the levels, and it picked features which relate to the um, mobility of the, of the materials in the, in the phases. And so uh, it, it managed to get a similar, um, so it, at, at least 67% uh, of the variance is explained by these structural features. However, if we only introduce, if we only allow energetic features, then the predictive capacity is very low. So that means that knowledge of the energy is not enough to predict the air light resilience. If we, the same is true if we include only order. So that's, it, this explains only 57% of, um, of, of the variance. So that means that both energetic and morphological features are needed to predict the JSC loss. And that makes absolutely sense because it's air light resilience. So it's about photo oxidation and photo oxidation depends on levels and it depends on the ability of uh, oxygen or water to move. So that makes absolutely sense. And the second thing is that the structural features contain that information. And so they can predict air light resilience um, because they contain, they can predict energies and morphology in the solid state. So that brings me to the conclusion that if I have shown a predictive model based on MRMR embedded GPR, and we got predictive capacity from chemical structure to solid state pro uh, properties. However, um, the data set currently is too small to do inverse design. So um, I have shown you here 
um, the explanation of variance is um, is eighty four percent. But if you do, I have um, we have also the, the the orange dots are the test data set, and the blue are the trainings data set. And if you do the um, the R square of the cross validation, then it's actually negative. So we are far from predictive capacity. Larry, um, can you please come to an end? I'm sorry. Um, um, so that would requires much more data and um, we require a much more detailed predictors. So with this, I'm at the end. I want to thank um, all the collaborators um, and I want to thank you for your kind attention and apologize for the overtime.